morning, everyone. Good morning. If you will, please stand with me and open your hymnals to page three. We're going to sing all three verses of Worthy of Worship. Page three. Through times when life seems to overwhelm us, 
The Bible reassures us that God's presence is with us to help us even when we don't realize it. The book of Psalms is full of reminders. Psalm 46.1 says that God is a refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Ephesians 5.8 reassures us that even though we once were in darkness, we can now live as children of light. The moments of darkness in our lives may be caused by the death of a loved one, the loss of a job or a home or another great tragedy of life, and yet there is a greater darkness in these tragedies, the darkness in the eyes of one who has not felt God's love, grace, and assurance of his hope. Those that don't know Jesus as their Savior, those without hope. But there is hope for all of us. There, there is light. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is our hope and light and darkness. Our dark times may also be times when God wants to teach us something more about ourselves and His love for us. <coughs> Romans 12, 12 advises us, Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Our faith can be strengthened if we will wait patiently and trust God's heart's desire to make us more like Himself. Tragedy or testing, dark days or dreary nights, God knows what we're facing. He is in touch with what is happening to us and He is concerned. And this morning we're going to talk about how we can access His power, the very same power that raised Christ from the dead is at our fingertips if we just ask for it and, and, and pray and ask Him to to help us through these tough times. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity this morning to come together to worship you. And Father, we just thank you for each one here today. We pray for those that aren't here. And Lord, we just pray for our church, Lord, that we would grow and be able to reach the folks in this community with the good news of Jesus Christ. Lord, we just thank you for your power that you've displayed in our lives so many times and, and, and been there for us when we couldn't help ourselves, Lord, but your, your great power comes through and sees us through the tough times and the good times. And Lord, we just thank you for loving us. We pray for our service today that we would just honor you in all that we do. In Jesus' sweet and precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. You can remain seated as you open your hymnals to page 445. We're going to sing all three verses of Sweet Hour of Prayer.
all of you here this morning. I just got a couple announcements. The same little things. It seems like 10 o'clock on Wednesdays is our midweek prayer meeting, but we have a great time. Usually just a few of us, but we have a great time. Ma'am? 10 o'clock? 11 o'clock. Thank you, Mildred. 11 o'clock. I'm sorry. Um, Sunday school. My next announcement is Sunday school at 10 o'clock. So midweek Bible study Wednesdays at 11 o'clock. And yeah, this, this Wednesday we're going to go out to eat afterwards, those of us that can. And hopefully every Wednesday from now on, if you of us want to go out and get something to eat. And then the Sunday school at 10 o'clock. And then one other thing down the road of peace, we're going to have a deacon election for Marvin Turner on September the 26th. If you will, please stand with me and open our hymn to page 515. We're going to sing all three verses of There's a Land that is Fair than
know for sure that you're a child of the King. Amen. I'm preaching a sermon, I think, you know, at the end of September. It says, do you really know for sure? I've got two or three little quick jokes on my phone I was going to share with you. I saw on Twitter this, this guy on Twitter named The Puzzle Pastor. The Puzzle Pastor wrote this. He said, somebody said to him, Pastor, now that we video stream our services, you have no excuse. We expect you to preach even when you're on vacation. Now listen to this one. Somebody in this audience might have wrote this. I don't know. The kids keep laughing about my memory. They won't be laughing at Christmas when there's no eggs under the tree. <laughs> and then one more. I don't know if this is funny or not. This is, this is sad. Someone asked me what my plans for the fall were, and it took me a moment to realize they meant autumn and not the collapse of our civilization. Lord help us. Amen. We're in this series called Getting to Know God More. And today we want to look at God's power. We've looked at His knowledge and His presence. Today we want to talk about God's power. That is a, a huge word or a huge topic to even try to grasp today. God's power. I read this week that the power, and don't ask me how people come up with this, but they said that the power of the sun produces more energy in one second than has been used in the history of the world. And that the sun at its current rate will be able to burn for another 30 billion years. And I don't know how that's 30 billion years and not 50 billion or 20 billion or forever, but someone come up with that idea. But that's a lot of power. But it's not as great as the power of the Creator who made the sun. Think about that. Uh, Jeremiah 32, 17, Sovereign Lord, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. What we're talking about is what theologians call the omnipotence of God. The omnipotence of God. God is almighty. God is all-powerful. He has unlimited power. He never gets tired. He never gets frustrated. Everything he does, he does easily. Nothing is ever too hard or difficult for God. It's easy for him to answer a prayer. It's just as easy for him to create an entire universe. He's all-powerful. In Luke, it says all things are, po are possible with God. Uh, today, I want us to look at the evidence of God's power, the application of God's power in my life, and the appropriation of God's power. In other words, how do I get God's power in my life? So number one, the evidence of God's power. The evidence of God's power. The natural place to start is creation. Uh, creation is a silent witness of God's power. Uh, look at Stone Mountain, uh, or any kind of mountain, any mountain. God's greatness created that mountain, or the ocean, or anything that you see in creation. Psalm 19, 1 and 2 says, The heavens are telling the glory of God. They are a marvelous display of His craftsmanship. Day and night, they keep on telling about God. And they've been telling about God ever since the beginning of creation. Every moment, creation is a witness to the fact that God is powerful. I don't understand how somebody can think that we just exist, that we just exist without a God. That's, that's just crazy thinking. The Bible says that the universe was created at God's command. He spoke the world into existence. He said, let there be light, and there was light. God one day said water, and there were oceans and rivers and lakes. God said fish, and the oceans were filled with fish. Vegetation, all kinds of vegetation. Stars, and the universe was filled with stars. That's what I call power. That's power that we can't even fathom this morning. He spoke the world into existence. And we see the evidence every day of God's power. Where there is design, you have to have a designer. It takes more faith to not believe in God than it does to believe in Him. Look at
look at Jesus' life. Jesus' life displayed the power of God. He had power over nature. He calmed the storm. That's one of the greatest miracles that I can fathom, uh, that, that we can think of. When he calmed the storm, he told the waves to sit down and shut up. And they became quiet. He spoke to a tree one time and it withered. He had power over nature. He had power over illness and death. He healed the blind, the sick, the lame, the diseased. He raised people from the dead, even himself. He had power over the devil. One time he told a bunch of demons to come out of a man and go into a bunch of pigs. The original devil hand. God's power is awesome. It's amazing the things, the amazing thing is that God wants to share his power with you and with me. So Roman numeral 2, the application of God's power in my life. That's what we want to spend a little time talking about this morning. The application of God's power in my life. Paul said in Ephesians 1.20, I pray that you will begin to understand how incredibly great His power is to help those who believe the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead. He wants to use that same power that raised Christ from the dead to help us in our time of need. That's amazing, incredible. He wants to share His power with you. The same power that raised Christ from the dead. There are so many people who are powerless. They just feel like victims, victims of society, victims of circumstances, by other people, by their health. They always feel a dollar short and a day late going two steps forward and one step back. They never seem to get it together. They feel very powerless. God says, I want to give you power in your life. So two areas that God wants to give you power. Power shortage one, the power of getting started. The power of getting started. Most of us have a problem with this from time to time. I know I do. Uh, how many good things have you been postponing in the last six months? I'm going to get around to that one day, but you just never get around to it. Well, what would you like to change about yourself but you can't get the motivation to get started? Do you ever find yourself paralyzed by procrastination? Someday I'll do this or that. Romans 7.18 says, I often find that I have the will to do good, but not the power. Uh, does this describe you? Uh, you want to do what is right and good, but you just don't have the power. Uh, how many of you have intentions are not good or not enough? The Living Bible says, no matter which way I turn, I can't make myself do right. I want to, but I can't. Uh, sometimes we get in this cycle of bad habits, and it's it's hard to break out of them. We don't know how to get started. The, the King James Version says, How to perform that which is good, I find not. A, a common symptom of people. Many times in life you will face tasks for which you are ill-prepared. You don't have the ability or the talent or the energy, the intelligence, the background or the money or the power. Uh, what do you do about those kinds of things where your performance does not match up to what needs to be done? That's where the good news comes in. Uh, the good news is that God can give me the power to perform. He can give me the power to get started. When I'm helpless, He's there to help me get started making the changes He wants me to make and that I want to make. Philippians 2.13 for, for God is at work within you, giving you the will or you could use the word desire, giving you the desire and the power to achieve His purpose. God says, I want to give you the power to keep on keeping on. So power shortage number two is keeping going, keeping going. It's one thing to get started. Many people are great starters. It's another thing to keep on keeping on, doing what you know is right, even when you don't feel like it. God says, I'm not only going to give you the power to get started, but I'm going to give you the power to keep on keeping on, to keep on going. Uh, many of you can relate to this next verse, 
Psalm 6, 2 and 3 says, I am worn out, O Lord. Give me strength. I am completely exhausted and my whole being is being is deeply troubled. For some of you, I think that's a life verse. I'm, I'm just so tired. I, I read re recently that the average homemaker walks 1,037 miles per year on the job. And you're wondering what your wife does. E everything wears you out eventually. What, what do you do when you get tired? God says, I want to help you keep on going. Ecclesiastes 2.11, Solomon said, I looked at everything I had tried and it was all so useless, a chasing of the wind. And there was really nothing worthwhile anywhere. Read, read the book of Ecclesiastes sometime when you get a chance. Solomon is so unique in the things he says there. And you thought the midlife crisis was a new thing. Solomon had one, a great, a great one right there back in the book of Ecclesiastes. You may feel this way, maybe about your career. I, I've tried all kinds of things, but it's just not working. Or about your marriage, or about your kids, or your health. I know I should keep on going, but I feel like giving up. The Bible says God can give me the power to keep on going. He can give me the power to not only perform, but He can give me the power to persist. That's good news. The ability that when I reach the end of my road, there's a second wind. There's ability that comes into my life, additional power, not to just get started, but power to keep going. Isaiah 40, 28 through 31 says, The Lord is the everlasting God. He never grows tired or weary. He strengthens those who are weak and tired. Those who trust the Lord for help will find their strength renewed. Now, that's a great verse. God will give me the power to persist because God's power is unlimited. He never gets tired. He never gets weary. He never goes to bed. He never gets tired of my prayer requests, of me talking to him or anything. He can create a universe and say, what's next? He does not get tired. That is personal encouragement to me. When I am drained and at the end of my rope, I know I can tap into a power that is unlimited. Doesn't the Bible say God rested after creation? Yes, it does, but it's not the same word or the same meaning as our rest. We rest because we're tired. But when it says after six days that God rested, it doesn't mean He was tired. He was finished. He was finished. There wasn't anything else to do. He was finished. And rest for God didn't mean restoration. It meant ceasing from creative activity. God didn't rest because he was tired. He's never tired. We wonder sometimes why Jesus hasn't come back as our world goes downhill faster and faster. He, he, he's long-suffering and patient, never gets tired. Isaiah 40, 31, to, to conclude what I started just a minute ago, it says, they, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint. God says, I want to give you the power to persist. God says, I promise you, those who trust in me. We try to do these things, try to make it through life in our own strength, we're going to fail. We're going to get tired. We're going to uh, be weary. We're going to be exhausted. But we have the power of God that we can lean on. Now, I know some of you may be thinking, that may work for you, but that doesn't work for me. I'm a believer, but I've never felt God's power in my life. I don't know if this stuff really works. The fact is, God's power is not automatic. I would say that a lot of Christians don't have God's power in their life to any degree. And there are some steps, some things that we must do to appropriate it. Uh, most Christians never get God's power in their life. They never key into it. They are just as defeated as unbelievers and just as tired and fatigued. The question then becomes, how did we get the power to the people? Four secrets. Four secrets of God's power on how to appropriate God's power in your life. 
on a consistent basis, on a daily basis. So Roman numeral three, how to appropriate God's power in your life. Number one, you admit your lack of power. You admit your lack of power. I admit that I don't have it all together. Our problem is sometimes people think, we think we're omnipotent. We think we're God. I can handle anything. I can do everything. If you don't believe that, then look at your schedule. Who are you kidding? If you burn the candle at both ends, you're not as bright as you think you are. Admit your need for God's power in your life. You can't do it all on your own. You come out of high school, Joe Jock, believing you can take on everything, take on the world, and then later you realize that you don't have all the power. Stress, tension, frustration come as a result. Midlife crisis is simply waking up to your limitations and realizing that you're not God. You cannot control everything. You, you're not going to reach every goal you set in your life. You're not going to make as much money as you may have thought. You are a human being. You have weaknesses. You're getting older. Your hairline may be receding. I'm glad I don't have that problem. What, what do you do when you realize you're weak? 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10, Paul says, God said to me, where there is weakness, my power is shown more completely. Therefore, I have cheerfully made up my mind to be proud of my weaknesses because they mean a deeper experience of Christ's power. For my very weaknesses make me strong in Him. When you pretend to be self-sufficient, you short-circuit God's power in your life. A self-made man needs to admit his inadequacy. And then he can start having power. Until then, you're going to burn out. Why would God give power to someone who thinks they can do it all on their own? Uh, they don't think they need God. Number two, you believe in faith. You believe in faith. The key to personal power in your life is faith. It's all about faith. Uh, not anything else. It's faith. The, the key to personal power is faith. Mark 9.23 says, Everything is possible for him who believes. Matthew 9, 29, according to your faith, it will be done to you. If that is true, and it is, let me give you two vital questions. What are you expecting God to do in your life? And what are you expecting God to do through your life? His work, He works according to faith. Since God's power is unlimited, we should not limit Him because of our expectations of Him. We limit God by our, our belief. God has given us atomic bomb power and we live firecracker lives. There's no problem too big for God. There's no, no request that He can't handle. So the issue really becomes my faith. What am I willing to believe God for? If you want to see God's power in your life, you must first believe in faith. Number three, speak in faith. Speak in faith. This is very important. You must speak in faith. 2 Corinthians 4.13 says, With that same spirit of faith, we also speak because we believe. Well, we must verbalize our faith. Uh, we must announce what we're intending God to do. You must not just think it in your mind. You must announce it, speak it, verbalize it. That's what a goal is. A goal, and when you set a goal in your life, a goal is a statement of faith. When I set a goal, I believe God can help me to do whatever that goal is. Uh, goals are simply statements of faith. The size of your goal is determined by the size of your God. Show me what your goals are in life, and I'll tell you what you're believing God for. We serve a great big, huge God, not a little bitty one. It's very important that you announce your goals up front. Say it in faith. The Bible says in the book of James that your tongue is the rudder of your life. It's like a little rudder that moves the giant ship. The way you talk to yourself and to others directs the course of your life. The Bible says in Proverbs, 
death and life are in the power of the tongue. So what are you saying about your marriage? Or about your job? About your career? About your health? About your finances? About your kids? Many of you are waiting for God to do something and believing Him for a miracle, but you're short-circuiting it by the way you talk. You're believing Him, but then denying it and negating it by your complaints. You hear people say things like, yeah, I believe that God is going to save my marriage, but my marriage is in the pits. Yeah, I'm praying that my kids will really take a stand for the Lord, but my kids are hopeless. I'm really praying that God will heal me, but I'm never going to get well. I, I want God to change my life and to help me break these bad habits, but it's just the way I am. I'm never going to change. And you're short-circuiting God's power in your life by the, by the things that you say. God's power is not automatic. You, you first must admit that you have a need for it, and then believe in faith, and then you speak in faith. Nothing is too hard for God. And after you believe in faith and speak in faith, then number four, act in faith. You've got to act in faith. This is very vital. And most people miss this point. Act in faith. You must step out in advance before the power is released. God wants you to take action even before you feel anything. You may not have to act as if I've got the power even though I don't have the power. In order to get the power? Yes. That's what's called acting in faith. You act as if God is going to provide. And He comes through every time. And when you step out in advance before you even feel it, then you, God sees your faith. Uh, do not wait for a feeling. If the only time you pray is when you feel like the devil is going to make sure you never feel like it. Uh, you need to do those things you know are right even when you don't feel like it. Immaturity is living by your feelings. Maturity is living by your commitments. You act as if in advance. Uh, so many people miss God's blessings in their life. Uh, and so many times I've shared my testimony about how God turned my life around and people say, you know, I want that, but they'll think, well, I can, that can never happen to me. I can never, God can never change me like that. He can. He did it for me. He could do it for anybody. Uh, people will say there's something I'd really like to do, but I don't think I can do it. So you never even try. And as a result, you never have the power. If you had tried, God would have poured the power into your life to make you competent to do it once you stepped out in faith. But if you don't even try, you will never sense God's power in your life. Recently I was reading how Joshua and the children of Israel came up to the Jordan River. It was very similar to Moses and the Red Sea. The whole nation had to pass through the river to get over into the Promised Land, and it was springtime, and the banks of the Jordan were overflowing. It, it was just impossible. And God said to Joshua, the leader of the Israel, uh, the leaders of, and the leaders of Israel, He said, "Take the leaders and put them out in front of the people and tell them to walk into the river." After they begin to walk into the river, I will dam it up a little way up north and the waters will recede and you will be able to walk across on dry land. The leaders began to walk into the river and the water was up to their ankles and in their knees and in their thighs and they were probably thinking, I'm not going to walk very much farther. But look at what happened. The Bible says in Joshua 3, when the priests put their feet in the water, the Jordan River will stop flowing. They acted as if the water would part, and it did. God released His power. And He can do this in your life. He can do this in my life if we just have faith. The amazing thing is that God wants to share His power with you, but you've got to follow these steps. First you admit you have the need, then you believe in faith, and you speak in faith, and then you act in faith. Step out in advance, acting as if. Now some of you are waiting on God to do a miracle in your life and you think you're waiting on God. In reality, God's waiting on you. He's waiting on you to take the first step. Uh, the power will not be released until you take the first step. It's, it's withheld. It's, it's a deliberate choice. I don't feel it, 
but I know it's the right thing to do and I'm going to do it. And you act as if you have the power to do what's right and it will be supplied. Tomorrow when you come home from work and you're exhausted and you're tired and you want to be left alone and you feel lousy and cruddy and you do not want to face your kids or maybe even your spouse and you just want to walk in the door and say to everybody, don't bug me. Instead of doing that, why don't you try this on the way home while you're driving home? Why don't you take a little pill called Isaiah 40, 31. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. I want you to think of that person that you find it hard to love. Or that person you find it hard to be patient with. Or that person you don't even like or you don't even want to be friendly to them. And then you say, how should a loving person act toward that person? Uh, if I were patient, how would I act toward that person? Or if I were friendly, how would I act? Once you've got that down, then you start acting as if you're loving. You're patient, you're friendly, whatever. And watch what happens. It will blow your mind. That is living by faith. Some of you, the romance may have died in your marriage a long time ago. And you say, I just don't have any feelings for my maid anymore. You need God's power to jumpstart the romance in your marriage. And you start acting romantic towards your mate. And you date your mate. You treat them like a date. Now compliment them. Build them up. Start acting romantic. And those feelings will come back. Because feelings always follow actions. By faith. Say, God, I want to feel this way and then act this way and watch what happens. So what that God is omnipotent? So what that God is all-powerful? What good is God's power if we never take advantage of it? You're going to need God's power this week. It is available. What are you expecting God to do in your life this week? We limit God so much by our unbelief. Uh, we live on a just a fraction of the power that's available to us. Paul said the same power that raised Christ from the dead is available to us. Amen. If you want power, you admit your weaknesses and that you need God. You admit your lack of power. Sometimes I feel so inadequate standing in front of you week after week. And when I think about the awesome task of communicating God's truth on a weekly basis, to so many different needs that it's almost overwhelming to me at times. I feel intimidated by it and I feel very inadequate. And then add to the fact the eternal implications of what is going on here on Sunday mornings that lives are in the balance between heaven and hell. And I add to that the sense of my own personal accountability to God as, as the pastor of this church that God's going to hold me accountable for the direction that this, this church takes. And sometimes the awesomeness of that task, the awesomeness of that makes me weak with fear. And I tremble inside sometimes when I think about that. But I have found, just like Paul, that in my greatest weakness, that in my time of greatest fear and weakness, I am strong. And God pours out the power into my life when I don't have it in myself. God's power rests on my life. And I know that or I couldn't be up here doing what I'm doing. You couldn't be doing what you're doing. Not because of who I am, but because I'm not anybody special, but because that anybody who will admit that he needs power and believes in faith and speaks in faith, when I'm driving to church on Sunday morning, I talk to the Lord and I tell Him what I expect to happen in the service. And I speak in faith and then I act in faith and I act as if... That I have the energy and God energizes my life and that can happen for anybody in whatever it is that God's called you to do every day of every week. Just try it. Just try it. God wants to show His power in your life. Remember that this week. God wants to show His power in your life. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank You so much for, for Your power, Lord. None of us could make it through life or make it through a day, make it through some of the hard times that we go through, Lord, if it weren't for your great and mighty power. And Lord, we just look at creation and we see how powerful you are. Lord, we look at things that you bring us through on a daily basis and we think, how did all of this line up? Uh, one day this week, 
that, that you just lined up everything that I had to go through that day and I was like just in awe of how there's no way that this could have happened if it wasn't for an almighty God in charge of every single thing. And Lord, we just thank you for watching over us and loving us, protecting us, providing for us because we know you are all powerful. Lord, I pray for that one that feels helpless, that feels weak and help, help us to all realize that we have access to your power because you are our Father in heaven. And we just thank you for all that you're going to do, Lord. In Jesus' sweet name we pray. Amen. If you will please stand with me as we sing the invitational hymn on page 316, Jesus is Come. Thank you. 